Welcome everyone to the global launch of the 2020 International Property Right Index. I want to thank uh, all the Property Right Alliance team members, Chris Zocco and Marianne Cortese for her great and outstanding work uh, in the communication strategy and editing the case studies. And uh, before starting the agenda, I want to quickly introduce the idea behind the International Property Right Index. The first edition of the index was published in 2007. This year, we are in the 14th edition, authored by Professor Sari Levi Carcinte. We are very proud and grateful to our international network of partners. This year, we count 122 think tanks covering more than 70 countries. I want to thank, in particular, the authors of the 2020 case studies, the uh, Carlos Augusto Chacón Monsalve, Maria Fernanda Gallego Ortiz for the, their case studies on Colombian property rights, and of course, our hero, Dr. Hernando de Soto for the case study on indigenous people and property rights in the Amazon, Martin uh, von Staden and uh, Jack Jonker for the case study in South Africa, and last but not least, uh, the case study of innovation IP and COVID-19, authored by our colleague Philip Thompson and Marianne Cortez. The system of property right is the most important guarantee of freedom. This is what Frederick von Hayek reminded us in the road to serfdom. There are three main questions that our index try to answer every year. What would the world be like without property rights? How would countries build and strengthen their property rights and improve their free market economy without a fair and transparent legal and political environment? And how would a company or a startup defend its own trademark and copyright without a consolidated intellectual property rights system? It is a great pleasure to have with us uh, John Sandage, Deputy Director General of WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, in charge for patent and technology sector. And of course, we want to thank, take the opportunity to congratulate Mr. Darren Tang as the new Director General of WIPO. Mr. Tang assumed his function on October 1st, 2020, for the next six years. We are particularly grateful to the WIPO for this great work in promoting and defending intellectual property rights all over the world. Every year, Property Rights Alliance coordinates an international coalition letter to celebrate the WIPO World IP Day. Last year, the letter was supported by 93 think tanks and organizations, and we really want to thank all of them for their support. I now leave the floor to John Sandage for his welcoming remark. Thank you, John, for being with us and uh, to celebrate the new International Property Rights Index. Well, thank you, Lorenzo. It's my, my pleasure to be here. Um, we've been having some technical trouble and already I've dropped off line once. So if you lose me in the middle of my presentation, my, my apologies. Um, but I'm very grateful to the Property Rights Alliance for the invitation. Um, I should add the personal note that I think this will be my last public event as the DDG for Patents and Technology at WIPO. Um, as Lorenzo mentioned, we have a new Director General, um, Darren Tang. Uh, Francis Curry has departed, and the others in the senior management team, the, the DDGs and the ADGs, we will all be departing at the end of uh, December, and there will be a new team, although we don't know yet who they're going to be. We're all waiting to hear uh, who Darren selects. So um, I will be returning home to the US uh, to Seattle, which is where I have a house, and be taking a few months off, and then I'll begin looking for my next opportunity. So if anybody has any good networking suggestions, they would be well received. Um, I don't have to tell you um, that um, uh, the importance of IP in uh, ensuring economic growth, and on behalf of WIPO, I wanna congratulate and, and commend the Property Rights Alliance for its advocacy work for promoting the importance of protecting intellectual property rights. Um, IP, of course, is at the center of the innovation growth nexus, and much has been written about the importance of uh, IP protection for economic growth. But even with that recognition, we recognize that there is more that can be done in relation to IP rights, and we need our partners and our stakeholders to work together with us on these initiatives. I would not be a good WIPO soldier if I didn't take this opportunity to share with you a little bit about what's going on at WIPO in um, these strange times in which we're all um, trying to adapt ourselves. If you have checked on the WIPO webpage, you will see there's what's called a crisis management dashboard. 
that we put up at the beginning of, of the pandemic, and you will have noted that the demand for our services remains very strong. For the PCT, you will see that uh, we're essentially operating at normal capacity. Uh, right now, we're at 93% in comparison to what we projected a year ago by our chief economist. So that's essentially unchanged for my colleagues in the um, Madrid system for trademarks and the Hague system for industrial designs. They have seen a little bit of a fall back already. Uh, Madrid is operating at about 86% of what it had projected and the Hague is at about 77% of their projections. To give you an example from the patent and technology sector, um, in addition to the overall level of PCT filings indicated on our dashboard, we've also noted actually some increases in PCT filings taking place, at least in certain high volume offices, even in this current uncertain situation. So for example, thus far in 2020, the European Patent Office PCT applications have actually gone up by about 1% over 2019. Um, and the uh, Chinese National uh, Intellectual Property Office, CNIPA, through the end of the third quarter of 2020, looks to be on course for an increase of about 7.5% as compared to their PCT filings in 2019. Now, as many of you know, the PCT application is most often a second filing and uh, claiming priority uh, of a previous national uh, application. And so it's important that you bear in mind that the PCT filings at WIPO are a lagging economic indicator. So we won't see any effect of the current COVID crisis until about a year after it began, which will be um, next um, spring. But as I said, to this point, the filings are actually um, in, the, in the big filers uh, going up slightly. Um, and, and that's good news. Um, uh, I didn't mention, but USPTO likewise has shown an increase during the pandemic of about um, 1%. We'll be watching this all very carefully because the PCT is hugely important to the financial uh, well-being of WIPO, but so far things are going very well. And the productivity of my staff and the staff in Madrid and the Hague system, all are operating nearly at 100%, uh, even though almost all of the staff, as I am today, are working from, from home. And I want to recognize um, how grateful we all are in senior management to the hard work of the WIPO staff and keeping these running uh, very smoothly. Let me mention just briefly that um, notwithstanding the COVID crisis, we've actually also had a very high number of accessions to WIPO treaties this year in 2019. 55 instruments of accession uh, were filed um, and that was the second highest annual accession rate in the last 12 years. Um, there's a strong presence of developing countries amongst accessions to WIPO administered treaties. Uh, 31 out of 55, and that's a testament to the fact that uh, even for developing countries, um, they recognize the importance of the international um, treaty system. In terms of the PCT, uh, we did have one uh, new country join uh, last year, uh, which was Samoa, and we had a number of them in the queue we had expected to join this year. Um, they've been delayed a little bit, but the countries that are in various stages of preparing to join the PCT are Bolivia, Bhutan, Bangladesh, Cape Verde, Jamaica, Mauritius, and Myanmar. And uh, all of those are countries in the developing world, and we are very much hoping that they will all uh, uh, complete the final steps necessary to bring themselves uh, into the PCT. You may also be aware of a number of WIPO tools and features that have come uh, online. Many of you know that, you know, WIPO through the uh, uh, patent scope system for the PCT, the global brands database, the global designs database. But we have some new tools that I would like to draw to your attention as well. Um, WIPO Lex was established to provide a comprehensive database of IP laws and multilateral, regional, and bilateral treaties. And the content is available on the database um, and it's significantly grown since its creation. Um, we have uh, added to WIPO Lex, WIPO Lex Judgment which is a new database that provides open and online access to leading judicial decisions in IP cases from around the world. Uh, in 2020, we also launched WIPO Proof, um, uh, which addresses the increasing amount of economic activity carried out or supported by digital technology and data. 
WIPO proof offers the user the possibility at a very low cost of creating a time stamp of data, which provides irrefutable and tamper proof evidence of the existence of those data at a given time and date. I also want to mention WIPO's uh, AI applications. We've made uh, a number of strides in using artificial intelligence in relation to our work uh, with text, uh, images, and industrial design uh, data, and with uh, speech to text. Uh, projects as well. We have WIPO Translate, which has been successfully used in Patent Scope. Uh, we've tailored it for other applications, including the Madrid and Hague systems. Um, all of this is being done in 10 languages, the six official UN languages, plus German, Japanese, Korean, and Portuguese. And WIPO Translate is now actually used by more than a dozen UN and other international organizations, as well as by a large number of IP offices of WIPO member states. WIPO's normative agenda, which are our treaty making functions, um, as I think you know, um, given the current political environment uh, internationally, it's been increasingly difficult for us to move forward on treaty making at WIPO. Um, nevertheless, the Standing Committee on Patents does continue to function uh, and they continue to have substantive discussions amongst member states about topics like inventive step, the sufficiency of disclosure, exceptions and limitations to patent rights, as well as procedural issues such as opposition procedures and process improvements to improve patent quality. So that's a bit about what's going on at WIPO, and I think I've probably spoken too long. Um, so in closing, let me again congratulate the Property Rights Alliance for the publication of its 13th edition of the IPRI 2020 version which, as Lorenzo said, features Singapore on the cover, uh, which uh, I have no doubt pleased Darren Tang, our new director general, who is from Singapore. Um, the IPI, uh, IPRI is designed to be a tool for policymakers, business communities, and civic activists, and it highlights the essential role that property rights play in creating a prosperous economy and a just society. And it serves as a barometer for the status of property rights by ranking the strength of the protection of both physical and intellectual property rights in countries around the world. Now, as you know, WIPO likewise uh, publishes the Global Innovation Index. Uh, we do that with Cornell University and INSEAD, and we published the 13th uh, edition of that in September 2020. Um, I uh, spoke yesterday with our chief economist, Karsten Fink, uh, and asked him about ways in which you could find um, linkages and, and connections uh, and strengthen, uh, strengthening the, the two publications that we have. And he noted that there's, in fact, an 86% correlation between uh, the rankings that we give in the Global Innovation Index and the rankings that the Property Rights Alliance gives in the IPRI. So we are clearly going in the same direction and, and we uh, have a lot of points of commonality in the ways in which we see the international situation. So um, I've covered a lot of territory in a short amount of uh, time, but again, I want to congratulate the Property Rights Alliance to thank Lorenzo for giving me the opportunity to make my last public appearance as DDG. And uh, I will hand off to Lorenzo and look forward to hearing the other speakers. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, John, for your presentation, for your work, and uh, for your great work you have done since 2014 in, with WIPO. We really appreciate that you with us is our your last your last uh, appearance and we really appreciate that is a great honor for us and we're really looking forward to work with the new director general and celebrate next april 26th the uh, wipe world ip day thank you again john for your great work now i leave the floor to grover norquist for his remark and i want to thank grover for his support during all this year for the publication of the index grover uh, grover norquist is the president of american sport tax reform and uh, You've been supporting our index uh, since 2005. Thank you, Grover. The floor is yours. You need to mute yourself. Oh, I was, sorry, apologies. Uh, Grover Nork was chair. I run Americans for Tax Reform and uh, we helped put together uh, the Property Rights uh, Alliance, which puts out this report. Uh, it puts together uh, dozens, more than a hundred uh, think tanks around the, the world who work on their country's property rights issues and make sure that we have a good uh, rating of how each country is doing, how countries could do better, how the United States could do better, how other countries could do better. Uh, Americans for Tax Reform obviously 
works to keep taxes down in the United States. We do the no tax increase pledge, which have kept taxes from being raised and helped to reduce taxes uh, over the uh, decades. Uh, but property rights is a critical issue. I mean, the, the success of the United States has been that it's been a relatively low tax state from the very beginning, uh, when as colonies we're paying one to two percent in taxes. But the other part of that was property rights and that property rights were widely uh, available and distributed. People owned which land was basically what people talked about, but we developed a good set of property rights rules and laws which allowed people to employ their property and create wealth and opportunity uh, with it. And now for intellectual property as well, uh, low taxes, property rights, rule of law makes for a, a free and open society, but also an increasing standard of living for all participants. And that's why the property rights fight is uh, and defending property rights is so important. And Lorenzo, your leadership uh, in putting together this uh, report each year, but then also weighing in whenever property rights are threatened or endangered uh, in the United States and around the world has really been helpful. And I am delighted to uh, uh, be a cheerleader for your efforts, Lorenzo. Thank you. Thank you, Grover. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your support. We, really, uh, we are very uh, proud that the uh, Property Rights Alliance was able to be founded in 2005, thanks to the partnership with Hernando de Soto, our great hero and property rights advo advocate all over the world. And thanks to this uh, uh, relationship between you, Grover, and, and Hernando, uh, the Property Rights Alliance was able to put together the International Property Rights Index. So now I'm very proud. Uh, to uh, introduce the 2020 Hernando de Soto Fellow since 2015, uh, Professor Sara Levi Carciente. She's the author of this edition, and uh, Professor Sara Levi Carciente is a Venezuelan economist with expertise in the field of financial macroeconomics and developing economics. She holds a PhD in development studies. She's a board member of the National Academy of Economic Science in Venezuela and full professor of the Universita Central de Venezuela. And during her academic career has held different positions, Dean of the Economic and Social Science from 2008 to 2011. And Professor Saralivi Cassinte is also a member of the scientific board of CEDISE, is a prominent and most important free market think tank and our partner in Venezuela. Um, Sari, thank you so much for your work. Now we are um, introducing your presentation um, of the index for the 2020. We have some technical issues uh, in uploading the video. Okay. Sorry for these technical issues, uh, but we are trying to fix it. Unfortunately, everything has to be online because of these pandemic issues. And we try now to upload the video. Uh, Venezuela is uh, experiencing a very bad internet infrastructure. So we decide to record the video of Sally Levy, but she will be online with us uh, to answer any question.
You can mute your set, sorry. Thank you. Yes, it seems to be you have a problem here with the with the recording we sent you. What uh, are we going to 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 do it again, or what do you think, Lorenzo? So, uh, first of all, uh, my regards to all the attendees who are having this small difficulty. Let me see what we're going to do. to harness innovation and drive prosperity. Therefore, in this 21st century, they are one of the main institutions that must be encouraged and strengthened. And one of the most important things to achieve a goal is to evaluate its evolution in time and space. And for that, measuring is a key tool. The International Property Right Index was developed to serve as a barometer for the status of property rights across the world. It's comprised of 10 items grouped in three components, the legal and political environment, the physical property right, and the intellectual property right. The first one, the legal and political environment component, provides insight into the impact of the political stability, rule of law, and corruption in a given country. It has significant effect on the development and protection of physical and intellectual property rights, which are the other two components of the index, reflecting the two forms of property. For physical property right, we include the perception of respect of physical property rights, how fast and easy is the registering process, and the ease to access to loans as a way to become an owner. For intellectual property rights, we include also the perception of respect of this type of property and the respectful patents and copyrights. The three components of the index keep the same weight and their scores go from zero to 10. This year, we include 129 countries, accounting for 94% of world population and 98% of world GDP. The selection of countries is determined only by the availability of sufficient data. We require 60% of the idioms in each of the components for the country to be included. The overall 2020 International Property Right Index this year is 573. The legally political environment component is the weakest one, followed by the intellectual property right, while physical property right is the strongest component. For the second consecutive year, the data show a slight decrease of the index, the legal political component and the intellectual pro uh, property right component, while the physical property right scores keep improving for a continuous fifth year. We must point out that the legal and political component requires particular attention as it shows an important setback during these years, placing it in values close to those of 2016. Here, you can see the 129 countries listed by the scores ranked from top to the bottom. And here, the same list organized in this occasion by quintiles. The number of countries belonging to each quintile increases from the top to the bottom quintile. The first with 18 countries, the second with 21, the third with 25, the fourth with 29, and the fifth with 36 countries. Hence, the fourth and fifth quintiles include 65 countries, which is a little bit more than half of our sample. Let's have a more detailed look to some results. In this year, Finland ranks first in the, in the index. 
as well as in the intellectual property right component in which it is followed by the United States of America. Switzerland ranks second overall, followed by Singapore, who additionally leads the physical property right component. New Zealand is in the fourth place and leads the legal and political component. Then come Japan, Australia, Netherlands, Norway, Luxembourg, Denmark, Sweden, Austria, United States, Canada, and Hong Kong. It's worth noting that since 2017, the intellectual property right index top countries are the same with a different or more or less say different lineup. On the other extreme, we find Haiti, Republic of Yemen, and the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela with scores below three. And then come Bangladesh, Angola, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Nigeria, Madagascar, Zimbabwe, Chad, Bolivia, Ethiopia, Nicaragua, Pakistan, and Mauritania. It has to be noticed that bottom countries show a particular weakness in the legal and political environment component, a first hint that we want to give to policymakers. For further analysis, we organize countries by geographical regions, development, income groups, uh, following first the IMF and this one, the World Bank classification, and by the integration agreements to which they belong. As countries show different demographic density, we ponder the index by population, and that reduced the score from 573 to 565. The 129 countries have a population of 7.32 billion, representing almost 94% of world population. Almost half of it lives in 29 countries with a mid score of the index. And we find that just, let's say 11% of the population enjoys higher levels of property rights protection in 21 countries. And they account for 50% of world GDP. So here, a second hint, we have to focus on fostering property rights system in densely populated countries. We also weighted the index by a gender equality components using 10 items of the OECD gender institutions and development database, scoring, ranking and grouping countries for a complete analysis. In this case, we see some countries with low gender component by high IPRI scores, like the emerging and developing Asia or MENA countries, while the country is shown by Latin America and the Caribbean or the Commonwealth of Independent States countries. As we know, cultural determinants are highly relevant to the topic of gender equality not always correlated with property rights system robustness. And given the extensive literature that records on the interactions between property rights and the quality of lives of citizens, we run correlations with 26 indices organized in five groups reporting productive drive, underlying conditions, human mobility, digital society, and health and life. For economic dynamism, we included five items in three categories, production, investment, and business trust. The GDP showed the strongest correlation followed by domestic investment measured by the gross capital formation. As we know, achieving performance is the result of creative actions in favorable environments that allow the emergence of positive and fertile synergies. 
We include six elements for this evaluation, competitiveness, economic freedom, business freedom, financial freedom, and economy openness, showing the strongest correlation with global competitive index followed by logistic performance index and business freedom. And international migration, as we know, is a growing complex phenomenon, disturbing almost all countries in the world. There are all kinds of explanations for this human mobility, from travel and leisure or working demands, while others are closely related to socioeconomic and political motivations. It is a common saying that people vote with their feet. Humans try to migrate toward prosperous conditions and flee from places that limit personal growth and threaten life. We measure freedom and necessity to mobility and the strongest correlation were with fragile state index followed by its component of human flight and brain drain. As information and telecommunication technologies are fundamental ingredients for the 21st century, we consider the suitability, competence, and relevance of property rights system for the new digital society. All the indices we included showed high and very strong correlations Network Readiness Index, Global Innovation Index, Digital Adoption Index, Telecom Infrastructure Index, and Digital Quality of Life Index. Our societies always focus on individual well-being or people's quality of life. In other words, the degree to which each member of the society is healthy, feels relaxed and has the opportunity to participate in and enjoy life, life events. Simultaneously, the COVID pandemic has highlighted not only the global fragility of health systems and some weakness of the global organizations to respond, but also the urgent need to strengthen health research and biotechnology innovations. With this in mind, we assess the relationship of the index in its components with prosperity, country perception, and the capabilities and innovation in health. Global Biotechnology Innovation Index shows the strongest correlation with, the inter with our International Property Right Index. Then comes prosperity index, which is even higher in the legal and political environment component. Then comes quality of index, uh, quality of life uh, index, citizenship, and finally, the best country overall and the global health security index. As we can see, all these correlations are clear evidence of the virtuous circle of which property rights are part. And finally, using the components of the index, we run a cluster analysis to gather similar individuals and arousing that three clusters are enough to explain the grouping of countries. Cluster one with 32 countries in red, cluster two, with 63 countries in green, and cluster three, which contains 34 countries, and you can see here in blue. Cluster one and cluster three are the two extreme poles in terms of the performance of their productive drive, embedded conditions, human mobility, digital society, and health and life indicators, as well as, of course, their International Property Right Index scores. Countries in the boundaries between two countries can use this information to make a special efforts to mine the gap and to place them in a higher level. 
Each cluster represents more than a grouping directly associated with property rights. They are groupings with common characteristics within them and with differences among the groups, confirming the consistency of our index and the relevance of property rights system in structuring societies. This way, our index results can be used as guidelines for policymakers in different countries, as well as in multilateral organizations or economic and regional integration agreements to which they belong, to improve their policies aimed at promoting development, defining it as a multidimensional and synergistic project. At the same time, it is a relevant tool for proactive entrepreneurs, business persons, and citizens to promote development and improve our quality of life. Let me show you now some examples of the information you will find in our webpage with country data. Here you can see the case of New Zealand and you can see it's 2020 uh, International Property Right Index course, its three components, and of course, the 10 items which are part of our index. Or you may be interested to see the evolution in time. And here you have the case of Malaysia, uh, when you have the index and all the three components from 2007 to 2020. Here, Cyprus, you can see not only the three components in a period of time here from 2017, 2020, but simultaneously the 10 items in that uh, period of time. Or here you may compare a few countries. Here are the cases of Argentina, Brazil, and Peru for year 2020. You may see it's uh, not only the index, the component, but also the 10 uh, items of the index. Or also the same uh, kind of comparison, the cases of Burundi and Ethiopia. By the way, Burundi is this year, even it has no very high uh, strong score, it's the country with the highest level of improvement in this year index. Or you may want to see how is your country compared to their peers, to the group it belongs. Here, the case of Czech Republic, which um, is a member of the high income countries, advanced economy, OECD, European, uh, European Union, and the CACA. So you may see how it is compared, its scores compared to their groups. And also here, the cases of the United States and Canada comparing to the groups they belong. North America, high income countries, advanced economy, OECD or the USMCA. So uh, let me insist inviting you to check our webpage, see the information available, download the reports and feel free to write us asking for the complete database since 2007. We will be happy to share it with you so you can use it for your research, policy analysis and business decision. Um, well, what can I tell you now is just thank you very much for uh, your attention and uh, we will be really happy to answer your question and your requirement. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sari, for your outstanding presentation and for your work uh, in updating the um, 2020 edition. You have been doing this uh, since uh, 2015. Great work and uh, we really appreciate uh, every year the way you present the index and the correlation that show a strong uh, relation between property rights and economic development. So now we have the pleasure um, to have with, with us our hero, our special guest, Dr. Nando De Soto, who will be 
speaking about property rights and COVID-19. The title of his presentation is A Plan to Use COVID-19 as an Opportunity to Accumulate Capital Instead of Debt. Dr. Nando de Soto is a prominent Peruvian economist known for his work on the informal economy and on the importance of business, business and property rights. His work in the developing world has earned him praise worldwide by numerous head of state, and his famous publication, The Mystery of Capital, has been translated in more than 30 languages. Since the publication of Mystery of Capital in 2000, his idea has become increasingly influential in the field of development economics. He is the current president of Institute of Liberty uh, for Liberty and Democracy, our partner think tank based in Lima, Peru. And this think tank is devoted to in promoting economic development in developing countries. He is currently running for the 2021 election as a president of Peru, so best of luck with the Avanza País Partido de Integración Nacional. Just to finish the uh, introduction, in 1999, Time magazine chose the Soto as one of the five leading Latin American innovators of the century and included him among the 100 most influential people in the world in 2004. De Soto was also listed as one of the 15 innovators who will reinvent your future according to Forbes magazine. And in 2005, Foreign Policy magazine ranked him as number 13 among the top 100 public intellectuals. Fernando, thank you for, us, for uh, so much for being with us. I know you have a busy agenda and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, <clears throat> Lorenzo. Uh, I uh, am delighted, uh, as you as, uh, as you just said, uh, somewhat disorganized because I'm running for office. At least uh, we think I'm running for office. This is a very messy country. So we're uh, trying to uh, get recorded actually on a property rights uh, agenda. So far, the polls look uh, pretty good. According to some of them, I'm upfront so that means property rights are important according to the others i'm not upfront i'm number three or number four uh we shall see uh basically all of this came about uh, this sudden move into politics so i'm you know really speaking just off the cuff because there's no other way i can uh, actually speak at this moment no time to really prepare a speech except to uh lay back on the couch and say what i feel what i'm thinking at the moment um what happened was that just before uh, uh, things got to where they are today, uh, as you know, uh, uh, Lorenzo, uh, coronavirus came around, COVID-19 came around. And when COVID-19 came around, uh, it accelerated everything we had expected. So the things we thought may happen 15 years from now are happening today. Our thesis was uh, had always been that a great part of underdevelopment, if not the crucial part, uh, if not the fulcrum of it really all, is that underdevelopment is characterized by poor property rights. Because at the end, what you do is you live somewhere, you work somewhere, and whatever it is, you, you trade and uh, you combine and uh, you uh, uh, build into higher valued items has to do with the exchange and the adding together of different rights. So if these rights don't work, even the whole industrial revolution couldn't even be imagined. And of course, in developing countries, the problem is not property rights understood as ownership. You go to any part in the Amazon, at least Peruvian Amazon, you go to any part of the 30 countries we've worked in the world, and you will see whether it's shanty town, the bazaars, or wherever it is, there are people that own things, and there's a uh, clear demarcation points of where the boundaries are. The problem, the issue is, what does the documentation say? What does the title say? And is the title that exists, is it recorded in such a way that I can verify that you're lying or you're not lying about what you actually own and how much and how many functions you can give to it? So it's not only a question of owning things is the, the theory, not the hypothesis, the theory. Uh, it is a question of how, what functions you can give it to it. Uh, you know, uh, as I said before, I can take, uh, here I've got something. I've got an apple. And that apple uh, obviously is there. And I can say it belongs to me. But there's no clear idea if it belongs to me unless it's a piece of paper. It really doesn't matter much with an apple. 
But does it say I own it? Does it say I can loan it? Does it say I can lease it? Does it say I can mortgage it? Does it say I can use it as a point of reference? Is it something that allows me to be identified, to be trusted, located? All these things don't come in the Apple all, or in a house. They come in the documentation. And the real problem in the developing world is the degree to which the documentation actually leads you to uh, uh, to do something uh, that is useful and allows you to accumulate capital. This is what I'll try to explain in connection to the coronavirus. What has happened as the coronavirus came in is that everybody in my part of the world was confined or we tried to confine them. And as they were confined, uh, of course, those like us who can work uh, more or less uh, using telecommunications, teleeducation. We're all right in certain aspects, the world's become a strange place, but some parts are even more efficient now from our point of view. But in a developing country, and that includes many parts of the former Soviet Union and, and developing and uh, communist countries, uh, the majority of people are not recorded or registered. And their work, therefore, in involves not using ideas and sending information back and forth as much as it does working with your hands. Now, when you work with your hands, of course, what you've got to do if you're confined is sit on your hands and there's nothing that you can do that's very much productive. So uh, a little herd of organization that works in Geneva, but is the whole oldest organization um, uh, of the United Nations called the ILO, International Labor Organization, and it's the largest one of them. It's got about 3,500 people working for them. They're spread in 45 regional offices around the world. And what they do is, among other things, collect uh, the right sort of left-leaning. They correct, collect statistics on labor. And some of the things they do is collect statistics on, um, uh, on who owns what and who is working where. That includes the informal economy, which the definition of which is, by the way, something we did for them many years ago in combination with Joe Stiglitz, uh, a Nobel Prize, uh, a distinguished Nobel Prize winner, and uh, Sweeney, John Sweeney, who used to be the head of the FAL-CIO in the United States. So it's the three of us. And I went out on the definition of the informal economy as those people whose property rights could not be translated into capital and therefore could not be used as guarantee against credit and as some form of a uh, a, uh, a guarantee, uh, a, a pledge against uh, investment. Fine. Well, now it turns out that the first statistics indicate that today in the developing world, and that includes my country, Peru, about um, uh, sixty percent of the informal economy's uh, savings and uh, capital have actually been wiped away as a result of these people not being out to work, not having the customers they had before, the slowdown in the economy, and it is figured that by the end of the year, actually most or all of whatever savings they had whatever capital they've accumulated will be wiped out for three fourths of them. Let me explain a little bit how that, uh, how that works. We are in the world about 7 billion, 500 million people, 7.5 billion of which 3.3 billion, uh, uh, with a B like bullet 3.3 billion are the economically active population. If you take that of, of the world, if you take all of that, all that together, 2 billion of those, that is to say about 60% of the world's population is in the informal economy. That is to say, using our definition, that you do not have property rights that allow you to generate capital, uh, accumulate savings, and get credit. And uh, that the coronavirus had just simply flipped our place uh, out. And all of a sudden, from Chile to Peru to Bolivia, people are walking in the streets. I mean, here it's street walking all the time. Violence has researched. Uh, dictators whom you would have expected should have been wiped out a long time ago 
the heads of Venezuela, et cetera, are sticking to the guns because everybody wants law and order. So this is a situation where uh, the issue of who can get us out of this mess or what can get us out of this mess all of a sudden doesn't just become a theoretical issue of how you improve a, a right that everybody believes in, but how do you get it going really fast because we're realizing now how crucial it is. So in this sort of pandemic, in the atmosphere of this pandemic, we made a proposal to the Peruvian people, which uh, we've discussed with Lorenzo and with Grover Norquist uh, many times, saying, look, we have a chance to really pull out of this very relatively quick. In Peru, which is just one example of many countries, uh, we're a very mineral rich country, but we've got all sorts of other things. But if you just take the minerals, those areas where the minerals that we have, and we've got lithium, we've got rare earths, we've got gold, we've got uranium, in turn, probably some of the world's biggest potential, aside from the fact that we're probably one of the world's biggest gold producers and one of the world's greatest uh, silver producers, you can't do anything that you plan to do in the future, including electric cars without our lithium, without our, do the computers without our rare earths. So all of a sudden, we should say, my God, we're going to take off any moment now because we've got over $1 trillion of minerals in the earth, which have been already uh, verified. We have proof that they exist and they're ready to go. The only problem is that the surface of the earth, of our earth, is owned by poor people. This is something that's happened in the last 34 years as the informal sector has widened throughout the world, they're squatting, the Arab Spring, agrarian reforms, uh, whatever you want to, poor people have inherited to a great extent all the surface of the earth that you have to drill through to be able to get at the minerals below or that you have to own if you want to get the Amazon forest on top of it. Now, why haven't we gotten it out? Simply because the people on the surface now, empowered by a whole bunch of conventions that have occurred since uh, co economic communism collapsed, actually want to be to have their property valued in such a way that, like in the United States, it doesn't matter who owns the subsurface or the mineral rights, they get a share in it as well. Since they don't feel they're getting the fair share, they blocked. In other words, companies may have all the concessions they want to the minerals below, but if they can't pierce, if they can't perforate, if they can't drill through the surface and pump it out, whether it's oil, whether it's minerals, uh, whether it's water, clean water, we've got probably the highest reserves of clean water in the world that flow from Peru to Brazil through the Amazon, you can't use it. That means that in the world you have today in developing countries over $150 trillion of minerals that are blocked because of property rights issue. Now, nobody's seen it that way. The American way of seeing it is, of course, the conflict area. My God, it's these Muslims. My God, it's these uh, lazy Latins. Uh, my God, when is it going to be the rule of law? But the fact is, it's a property rights issue, which, of course, is a rule of law issue as well. And so the question that we know now is if you actually get the property rights working, that is to say the surface rights of the poor are... Uh, put together with the mineral rights of the large companies, you can get uh, you can get the country you can get our countries going pretty uh, pretty fast. But nobody really knows how you can get that being done without actually creating a different a series of additional steps to uh, the, to the property rights situation, which go beyond uh, the parameters or the contents of. Uh, uh, the traditional way of viewing property rights as the measuring of the surface or the measuring of things that you own. It means going a little bit beyond ownership into making sure that the things you own can also be exchanged. So in the course of that, uh, in the course of that battle, we indicated that we had found the formula. And now we are, as a matter of fact, work is starting to work with what we call uh, regulatory compliance technology, rec tech, just like there is uh, financial technology. Uh, rec tech has to do with uh, being able to uh, track uh, documents in such a way 
that these documents, one on top of the other, end up uh, certifying something in a way that creates trust at the other end. Let me give you uh, the uh, uh, how, what, how this refers to mineral rights. If you are an American miner, say you are, uh, I'm trying to think of an American company, I don't know, Anglo-American, uh, say you're a Canadian company, you're a French company, you're whatever it is, you want to, before you're able to extract anything from the Middle East, Central Asia, or North Africa, you want to have, first of all, a property right, even though you won't call it a property right. In the States, it's a concession, but it is a property right. It means I, the government, own the subsurface, and what I'm going to give you is a property right to the minerals that you extract. Now, you have to have that in order and well titled. You then need the surface title from whoever's on top, uh, in our case, mainly in uh, Amerindians, Quechuas, uh, Incas, uh, Aztecs, uh, Mayas, uh, Waranis, uh, whatever you want to call it. And they've got to give you the property rights so that you've got that bundle, and now you are able to extract and own and transform the minerals that you've got below. Now, what do you, once you've got all of that, it's a series of about 80 documents, one on top of the other, that create that new property right. It goes from the title that there is locally that is recognized, enforceable, as it was uh, transformed into a Spanish title during the conquest, as it was transformed into a Republican title uh, after the Spanish conquest, as it was transformed into standards that would allow it to be recognizable both locally and internationally as both laws the local law and the international law were put one to the other it's one piece of paper over another piece of paper like your passport your passport is really a compound made out of various documents that identify you all the way to the point that when you have a peruvian passport i now have an identity document that doesn't do what a local identity document does here, which is it makes me recognizable for a series of uh, civic purposes. I now have one that is done according to Vienna Geneva Conventions that allows me to travel out, but that's not sufficient. Before I can get into the United States, I've got to add to this passport a US visa, which is an addition of a bunch of other certifications that cover my identity from an angle that makes Americans trust me and be able to track me. So they have to, at the end, it ends up with a stamp, but it's a whole process. It can take 30 days, 60 days, 90 days before a Peruvian gets a stamp on his passport and can travel to the United States. So whatever you do before it moves, as Adam Smith would have said, as Marx move, uh, would have said, is you need a whole bunch of titles, one after the other, packaged in such a way so that whether it's credit, it's passports, whether it's investment, whatever it is, you are identified in a way that produces money. For example, when I have my credit card with me, when I go to a, one of these machines that pushes out the card, I mean, I'm putting in the card, but what it basically does is it pushes in a particular identity I have, which immediately spurts out uh, money. Now, when you want to take all this paper that you have of a property rights according to Peruvian law and international law, which is the one we look at in IPRI, uh, and I am about to take it to raise capital, actually to form capital in the United States, what I have to do is make it conform to Securities and Exchange Commission um, uh, uh, standards which were originally set out in 1933 and 1934. And these, uh, and these are uh, the uh, standards which prevent fraud in financial markets. Now, how... and take it to Wall Street, and then hand it over to an originator, or sell it to a, to a, a company, or um, and make sure that it is underwritten appropriately, and then take it 
to the uh, entrance uh, booth of a bank, which takes all these documents together and says, yep, this is collateral. This is a guarantee. This creates the identity. It, it passes all the anti-fraud It's capital. It's a bunch of documents. And then those documents go inside the bank and then outside the bank, which the United States, I think, produces 80% of the money. Your Fed only produces about 4 or 5% of the money. And then it goes out and then it tells the investor, the Peruvian or whatever joint venture partnership goes, thank you for having passed through the entrance booth. Your documents now outside. We're going to issue the payment means that you need to make your investment back in Peru. Now, that part, how do you take all the property rights documents of the mines in Peru and the indigenous people and then make them cross the Caribbean right across uh, the Rio Grande and into New York or Toronto or wherever it is and become money is a pretty fuzzy place that we've been investigating so far, which is how do you take a property rights title in Peru in Azerbaijan, in Saudi Arabia, and actually systematically, systematically make sure that the poor people in our countries, the ones that are rebelling, that are marching in the streets of Paris, that are marching in the streets of Santiago, etc., understand that their property not only gives them a right to own a patch of land, have a garden, have a garage, have a playground for the kids to be in, but actually creates money that can be used for investment and capital without which the world doesn't go around, according to, to Adam Smith and to, um, and to Marx. And so all of a sudden, when we've said this all across Peru, and with this I'm ending, because I'm a, one of the other long-winded Latin Americans you've surely met before, we all of a sudden found out that as we announced that this was a solution to coronavirus, we now have gotten 200 uh, uh, associations of property owners, whether they own because they own uh, bakeries or because they own uh, bottling plants or because they make shoes or because they're agricultural people coming in, representing 10 million people, and they've said, that's it, it's property rights. That's what should be on the political agenda now because the reason we're perishing as corporations is that, or as businesses, even though we're small businesses, is because our paper can't get to the markets now as fast as it needs to, and we're in a crisis. I sent now, um, Lorenzo, and with this I end, if you can pass the list that Gustavo sent you of the 200 um, uh, organizations in Peru, back us up. Go ahead, please. Okay, so then, Lorenzo, that's it. I uh, herewith wish to declare, Lorenzo, that we wish to challenge IPRI as being the most important property rights organization in the world. We're taking over. We've got a constituency. This is, of course, just a joke, a bad, a bad Latin American joke because we owe so much to you. But we're really forming a very wide property rights alliance, the purpose of which, it's interesting, you know, uh, Coronavirus is a tragedy for our countries. I mean, the amount of people dying informally as well. You know, we do, it's not only that we have illegal businesses, we have illegal bur uh, uh, burials. And so we don't really know how many people are dying, but it's really pretty bad. However, 
the good side of any crisis, the upside, as the Chinese can say, it's an opportunity. And the opportunity is now people are all of a sudden realizing that it's not the apples they own, it's not this that they own, it's the fact that they can make them function to create capital that really works. And when all of a sudden you reveal to the whole country, look at all of this wealth, we've always been a beggar sitting on a bank of gold, it's absolutely true. But the reason we're not getting at the gold is not because there's no technology for it. It's because you can't finance the extraction of anything because we live on what God has given us. If you do not have the documents, the property documents that create trust. And one of the things that we've got to get over is thinking that a property right document is one thing and a financial document is another thing. No, they're both part of a large value chain that we have not yet studied exactly how it links. In other words, the links are obviously done because people do go out, discover gold, and get it financed, but it's artisanal. The, me me the automatic mechanism that you have in places like the United States, where the moment you have a house, you know, it's automatic that you can get a loan on it. Honey, I've been promoted to vice president. We're moving from California uh, to New York. And, uh, you know, I'll take the plane now, you sell the house, and I'll see you with the kids tomorrow morning in Westchester or whatever it is. It ain't automatic here. And until it doesn't become automatic, we're beggars sitting on a bunch of gold. So I look forward to collaborating with you on these matters. Now I'm into politics, which is I do not recommend anybody get into it. If you think it's messy in the United States, it's really messy here. Thanks for the opportunity, Lorenzo, and thank you. Uh, and thank, uh, of course, uh, Grover for his continual support. Thank you so much, uh, Hernando. Thank you again for your support for all this year. Thank you for the case study you wrote uh, this year for us. And thank you for your presentation. I found it very inspirational, especially now in this uh, time of pandemic and economic crisis. Uh, now, Hernando, we have a special session with uh, uh, three uh, good friends of us, uh, Special section of uh, questions. We have uh, Congressman Pablo Viana from Partido Nacional from Uruguay, with Gianluca Lorenzone, Secretary of Education from the Ministry of Economy Brazil, and Congressman Mario Zabrowski from the uh, Serbian Political Party in uh, Ukraine. This uh, we invite this uh, special you know, all of them, all of them, they were leader of the think tank in their country. So uh, we want to start with uh, Pablo Viana and uh, Gianluca Lorenzon, and after we move to Mario Zablowski. So please uh, move forward. Thank you so much. Pablo, please ask a question. For me. Thank you, Lorenzo. How are you, Hernando? Yeah, Lorenzo, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this prestigious event. It's been a pleasure to enhance my knowledge, listening to Dr. De Soto. I would like to ask a question to Dr. De Soto. What should the Mercosur countries do to improve property rights protection? What do you think? Thank you. If you're asking about Mercosur, you, you asked about Mercosur, Pablo, you're asking about Mercosur, yes? Yes, sir. Yeah, Mercosur. Well, you know, uh, I'm, I'm sorry I can't really answer that question because I am from Indo-America as opposed to being from Mercosur. From our point of view, of course, we're a mixture of Aztecs and Apaches and uh, a bunch of Africans, and uh, we're just that way. While you guys, the way we see it is we are culturally the same. I mean, obviously, because of your name and my name, we both we probably both come actually from Spain and Italy, but you're a different situation. You're somewhere between Europe and Latin America, so I don't really know what it is that doesn't uh, that doesn't uh, work uh, uh, in uh, in your part of the world? What I've never I mean we've never been called to Chile. We've never been called to Uruguay. I once gave a conference in Uruguay. It was really pleasant, but I felt uh, I wasn't talking your game. I was talking another game. So uh, I don't know where that differ that difference is. Wherever I have, wherever I've gone and I've had the opportunity of working, I've always found how it can click in. For example, we've done a lot of work in what you, in, in Russia. I've worked directly with President Putin. I've done a lot of work in, uh, uh, in North Africa, all the way from Mubarak to, I mean, for years with, uh, with Gaddafi. And I was able to sort of crack the nut there. 
but never having worked in um, a, this was a long a long explanation or two i wouldn't have any i any idea of how that worked the only thing i can think of as a commonality that would comes to mind is um, has it may have to do with the way we have lacked uh, the ability to modernize Roman law. Uh, this might be a cue. This, okay, this is a cue because I do want to find something useful to say. Uh, you know, the, the Germans uh, back in 1806 were defeated by uh, Napoleon, who was sweeping uh, Europe because he had property rights reforms, le registre frontier. It was the French Revolution, it was blue blood. Nobility and the clergy should not only be the, the owners of land and things, it should also be the people, what the French Revolution called the Third Estate. So this gave Napoleon an ideological advantage. He was like a modern-day communist. He just swept through the place. And uh, in the process, uh, the, the Prussians, Wilhelm II, was defeated by Napoleon as he proceeded towards Russia, and he couldn't recruit troops. And so what the Germans did is they said, look, there must be something to this property business. Now, history doesn't write a lot about this thing, of course, because history likes to know who's king, who's queen, who got married with who, and who's going to bed with who. But the real story behind this was that property ownership was winning over. Now, at that time, therefore, Wilhelm II decided to do what he called the, uh, the uh, uh, Hardenberg reforms, Stein Hardenberg reforms, which consisted in then be a giving his farmers and peasants titles so they would be willing to be enlisted to fight Napoleon's army. And that produced a whole, the Grunbuch system and the whole property rights revolution in the rest of Europe. Okay? So what he did at that process and what I started studying as much as I could is I studied the Stein-Hardenberg reforms, which are how you take Roman law and make it flexible and adapt it to finance. Now, it's very hard to do so just on the basis of history because the whole Stein-Hardenberg reforms, which lasted all the way up until Bismarck in 1871, are packed into 12 volumes in the University of, uh, of Frankfurt. But it basically tells you that in every country you go to, uh, the process whereby a piece of paper that simply says you own so much or that much becomes a financial instrument and one uh, that can leverage to an incredible extent, and it's like a Swiss knife, 28 blades instead of just having one, how that's done in every country isn't hasn't really been tracked, <clears throat> which is, to my figuring, and with this I end, why the United States has difficulty in teaching us how you do it. Because they don't know how they got there. It's a result of judge-made law. It's the result of, uh, uh, of uh, going west, young man. It's the result of 32 preemption acts whereby uh, all those Europeans imported to the United States to go west and do manifest destiny like in cowboy films are shown, you know, they just go over, they take away or, or the Indian territory, they fight among each other, Billy the Kid, Wyatt Earp, and somehow or other 32 preemption acts defeat the decisions of the Supreme Court of the United States. And by the time you get to the gold rush of California, the United States is full of guys who have decided on a local basis how the hell they're going to deal with their property rights and real estate brokers come around because they don't like bureaucrats start making deals. Now, how do you teach that to a developing country such as ours, which is not based on judge-made law, but on statutory law? So the reply to all of this, uh, uh, to all of this, my dear Latin American uh, friend and uh, uh, Latin American compatriot is, it's a lot of hard work, but it actually means challenging the existing Roman system, which was not made for a free economy. It was made essentially to favor the state and the big oligarchy. Uh, more of that later. I'm sorry because I realize I'm taking over all your time, which I have a tendency to do. But in politics, it might get me somewhere.
Thank you, Hernando. We have a question now from Michael Dantas, Deputy Secretary of Competition from the Brazilian Ministry of Economy. Hi, nice. Thank you for joining nice. us. Thank, Thank you, Michael. You. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Gianluca was just called by Minister Getz, which, by the way, is a huge fan of Hernando de Soto, recent, and uh, he sends his compliments. Minister Getz literally always mentions you, so it's a great pleasure to be here. Our question is, in Brazil, we have already been taking some, some very good steps on land, uh, actually related them, land legalization, land title regularization, but as it usually happens in Latin America, there are additional steps. So it's not enough that someone has a property right saying this land is yours, this apartment is yours, this building is yours. They also need to abide to adhere to building codes. So they need to say, hey, your, your building, your home is technically okay, we approve that. And that is a challenge first because you can't get loans, you can't uh, get loans on your property. It's not enough that you have that. And there is a very valid debate between security and property, which is a valid debate. You need, you need to have properties that are secure, but you also need to give them property rights. So what's, what are your takes on this, on this debate? And also, have you seen anything like that in other countries, some benchmarks that we could use? And we have another additional question, but uh, that would be our first question. And thanks, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. Uh, we, don't, we don't have enough time because we still have other presentation, but okay. I guess the question, the question is for Hernando and for Sari, both of them. Yeah, so, we yeah. so the, second, the second question would be for Sari, and let me put yeah. it because uh, actually professors Abhijit and uh, Duflo, they, they mentioned a study in, in Peru that says that the fact that women had property rights made them have le have less kids because they had more power in the relationship so they could say hey i don't want to have it for kids more, more kids right now and focus on my career so there is an impact of property rights on minority rights so my my, my question for both of them especially for professor sarah is how this index can help us convince these governments on how property rights help minority rights as well because that's a very, very relevant agenda those would be my questions thank you very much Lorenzo, I can try to give a quick answer because I may have to leave. I've got uh, lots of voters outside. I hope they're voters, not protesters, but here it comes. I got a lot of my inspiration from Brazil. When I started uh, this racket here of research in Peru, I, uh, I went and I asked, uh, uh, I was very interested in uh, seeing how uh, processes to simplify worked. And so I got in touch with uh, two people that had to do with a uh, process called, excuse my Portuguese, uh, desburocratização, a process, uh, a process that had been That's very good. Good. And the one was called Beltrão, and the other one was uh, called Piquet Carneiro. So I brought, got Piquet Carneiro to come to Peru, and I went to Brazil to find out how you did desburocratização which in, in, uh, translated into English would be debureaucratization. So the first, so I did a few, uh, I did a few transformations to it, and it is now becoming the World Bank what is called um, the doing business system because it was very successful in Peru. And Peru, when we implemented it in the 90s, we soared. I mean, in terms of economic growth, we went up to 10% and all that. And it was really this bureaucratization zone turned around. We first of all changed the name because we said if you say debureaucratization, you're going to get the bureaucrats against you. So we took that away and we called it simplificación administrativa. That's just politics, but it's important. The second thing we did is instead of analyzing only cost benefit and doing the office of management and budget trick, uh, what we did was we installed the system to receive citizens' complaints on the basis of 10 bracketed uh, means of getting information, which therefore allowed us to process a lot of information, and then eventually, on the basis of that, find out that the obstacles were where you did not expect them to be. And that allowed us to unplug it here and there, and it started streaming. And we'd love to talk to you about that, because even the World Bank has missed some of that. And let me address your second issue, one of the things that happened was that we took every issue that you could think of, religious, whatever it is, people complained. They were, there were complaint boxes. At that time, it wasn't digital. So you put it like in mailboxes in front of TV stations. 
the uh, or newspaper stations, uh, and they would get the stuff, and they would say, "Terrible story in uh, in Via El Salvador, little old lady working in a shoe in a boot with thirteen children is not able to get ahead." Scandal, and then it went on to our TV program. Scandal. We would find out who was responsible, give them seven days to sort it out. They're fired if uh, they're political appointees and they get an administrative process. If they're not, all right. So here I reach the, the woman's side, which, uh, which is very important. The questions, we, we got the questions so refined that we were able, as a matter of fact, in a session that I participated in myself, for women to, uh, to ask women, are you ladies here who are representing women's or, or fem, uh, feminist organizations? Uh, are you all married? And the reply was, we're all married. All right, then the question would be, are you married by the church or are you married by government? And then the reply was, the majority of them were by the church. So it says you got no rights except, I mean, you might get them one day when you die and there's a nice man with a lot of white hair on his face. And he might give you some merit for that. But if you want to get a property right in Peru, you better be married. Because it's only the marriage title that actually creates a link. On the basis of that, all of a sudden, we got enormous support from women. And our titling projects got off the ground. Because women realized that the title meant a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of things. And when we did that was 19, uh, about 1991, 1992 when women owned about 38% of land in Peru, and today they own 65%. So the thing here, uh, 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 Mikael, is what you have to do, or how do you pronounce your name, Mikael or Michael? In uh, we go by Michael. Michael. Yeah. Okay, so the good <laughs> yeah, idea here is the facts are on the ground, Michael. The facts are on the ground. The poor people know, and as a matter of fact, our program which is an adapt an adaptation of Brazilian desburocratization, says, Usted es el que sabe donde le ajuste el zapato. Díganos donde duele. You know where your shoe tightens is. Tell us where it hurts. Once you get that into place and you find how you get that information and process it, you will know that the reason property rights don't work have nothing to do with property rights. It's in Wall Street. Another part of the information is in marriage laws or the fact that the catholic church says you know it's enough that you get married by the church and the rest doesn't matter that much because god has blessed it so the idea is property rights this is the sum of it property rights is all over the place it's not just in property rights law the moment you do that and you decide you can go everywhere you will find your answer thank you hernando uh, so thank much you. for your uh answer really or very detail oriented uh sorry do you want to answer and after we move uh, we're going to ask it to marian tabloski a congressman from ukraine uh, to yes. ask the question well Thank you so much. Uh, as and, uh, sorry, uh, Hernando, uh, question i would say sorry. that any minority has sorry, sorry, much more sorry. Yes. sorry sorry hernando if you need to leave i really appreciate your time and your enduring friend uh, friendship and uh, uh, fight for freedom and property rights all over the world. Thank you so much uh, for your support. Thank you, Lorenzo. One thing you can count on us Latin Americans for is enduring friendship. It lasts all the way. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. And good luck. Please, sorry. Sorry for interrupting you. Please, sorry. The floor is yours. Not sorry. Question that absolutely any minority has much more difficulties uh, to to exert their rights, and absolutely that's uh, something we find every. Uh, you may find minorities discriminated by religion in some countries, other by ethnical reason, other by race. And there is something that we find or we may find more or less everywhere. And it's that discrimination by gender index. We created that component of gender equality, which wants to ponder that situation inside a country. Of course, as it has been said, you may empower a minority and of course support them 
to overcome that situation. But the main issue in a country is to have a that support property rights. And there is another question that we received It was about the APR APR in South America. Uh, so what can be done? And I was saying I was thinking about the figures. And when you see more carefully South America, Latin America, or even Central American and the Caribbean countries, the weakest element, the issue to be tackled is copyright piracy. You may see uh, levels very, very low. Of course that gives uh, an idea of perspective of the region about how is the perception of property rights very weak and particular in intellectual property rights uh, protection but generally speaking about ipr i would say that uh, given relevance and a higher social recognition of no issue for uh, for development and to create and stretch that ecosystem and entrepreneurship and business, it's very important. So also the conscious of the meaning and the relevance of knowledge, uh, it's very important in the issue. And that goes in the way of education. But if you want to figure out where to tackle the point here now in this issue, to answer as short as possible as I know we are running out of time. Thank yeah, you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Uh, we have now Marian Zablowski, a congressman from Ukraine. Marian has been uh, working with, uh, with us for uh, a lot of years and he's been working a lot on the reforming property rights system in Ukraine. Okay, Marian, thank you for your leadership in Ukraine. Uh, you published years ago with us a, property, a case study on property rights in Ukraine. So please, uh, thank you for joining us today and uh, your question for Sari. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for having this discussion. It was very, very useful. And thank you for having them regularly. Uh, actually, I, I had a very good question for uh, for the previous speaker as soon as I heard that he worked for Vladimir Putin, but I think this will help. Uh, but uh, I want to ask two questions. First of all, in terms of proper right indexes, which countries have made a significant and notable strides in terms of improving the is property rights indexes and secondly generally are you more optimistic or pessimistic towards property rights in the upcoming years because we have entered the quite a significant economical crisis which we do not feel up to now it will result in the upcoming years and my feeling from history when people get into situations where resources are more scarce they start to feel like they are more privileged to own those resources than others on national issues or whatever other issues. And this creates conflict towards property that already exists and may force uh, redistribution, which is not maybe very favorable or very legal. So quite honestly, I'm more pessimistic, but maybe you can correct me if there are basis for more optimism in the upcoming years. Generally speaking, I'm always optimistic, but I have to agree with you. When you have a crisis, a difficult situation, generally speaking, in the world, you have much more pressures to focus on other issues that are in the short term, and you forget the economic dynamism of property rights, which is very, very bad news. And, and I'm very... Um, I'm not so optimistic about next year results. I'm very afraid that this situation of COVID will lead countries to forget some issues which are so much important for real development. And I'm afraid we'll have those elements uh, to be seen in the following year and even the, uh, after those in a couple of years too. However, it's our work to alert countries about this issue, especially 
uh, trying to show how pe uh, how those countries that has weakened their property rights system has gone to a very very uh, bad situation for the populations and this is the issue that i never forget to remember this is not only um an issue of a legal issue about defending property rights what do society then the line condition for that to be held and we are looking for the benefit of the more amount of people not only in the present but in the future and this is what we have to focus when defending property rights thank you mary thank you maria thank you thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you absolutely thank you so much sari and thank you maria we are moving now to the second part I and mean, we are not abusing of most of most of your time uh, in the second part, we have a two presentation about two case studies. Now we have a Philip Thompson presenting a case study he wrote with Marianne Cortese. Uh, the title of the case study is Innovation Accelerated Factor Enabling Rapid COVID-19 Vaccine Development. I want to say thank you so much, Philip Thompson and Marianne Cortese. Philip Thompson is an IP uh, specialist and trade specialist for the Property Right Alliance. He's also the pillar of the Property Right Alliance. He's also the creator and founder of the new index that I really recommend everyone to check out on trade, International Trade Barrier Index that's been launched last year in 2019 in Brazil. Philip, thank you for so much for uh, joining us for the, this uh, case study that I think is very important during this uh, pandemic time. Thank you so much, Lorenzo. I want to say it's a great pleasure to present at the launch of the International Property Rights Index with you and with Hernando and uh, with sorry, Dr. Sari Levy. It was only a few years ago, I was in graduate school and I read uh, The Mystery of Capital, which led me to research more about property rights and find the property rights uh, index and the property rights alliance. And then uh, a few years, uh, a year after that, you started receiving emails from me to intern. And so uh, now I'm happy to be presenting my own case study with the launch. Uh, written with uh, our colleague, Marianne Cortez. Uh, so this case study concerns the uh, factors that led to rapid innovation to respond to COVID-19. Um, uh, before I go in too much into that, I wanna review some of the important aspects about COVID-19 that make it uh, different from other pandemics and flus and diseases we've seen before. Uh, the main thing is that it has a really high transmission rate of 2.5, sorry, 2.5, which makes it, it's, uh, it, it transmits to people, uh, it's more contagious than the pandemic flu of 2009, the pandemic flu of 1918, it's more contagious than SARS. Um, the interval period between symptom onset and maximum infectivity is uh, very short and the incubu incubation period is uh, longer, which means by the time you develop symptoms, uh, also symptoms are very moderate, and uh, we don't know exactly how many are asymptomatic versus pre-symptomatic, develop symptoms later, but most people experience very mild symptoms. Uh, and so by the time you feel sick enough to get a test and test positive and begin quarantine, uh, you've already uh, spread it to a few more people days before you felt symptoms, which is if you have Ebola or one of the other uh, uh, flus, you feel sicker sooner and you'll quarantine sooner. And uh, there's less days you have to trace back to see who you, you were in contact with. So these aspects make it uh, difficult to use traditional methods of uh, quarantine, contact tracing, uh, and what's, what's worked in the past. So we need innovations. We need in inventions that can help us uh, inoculate ourselves against the virus, help fight the virus, detect the virus, uh, and faster and earlier and quicker. Uh, so, so how did the United States do it? And by January, it'll be 10 months since the pandemic has been declared. And we're on track to see uh, uh, three vaccines uh, approved by then and 300 million doses available by January. At the international level, there's the COVAX facility, which is on track to have a billion doses of vaccine delivered in 2021. Uh, so how did that happen? 
in the U.S. and uh, around the world. In the United States, we had, uh, um, from the regulatory side, we have Operation Warp Speed, uh, which united efforts uh, from the government, from many different agencies, the NIH, CDC, on identifying potential candidates and offering advanced market commitments that kept the private enterprise system intact. Uh, and we've also had from the FDA, CTAP, and active programs that helped uh, guide clinical trials early on, and they helped um, uh, provide subject matter expertise to companies and organizations that had potential candidates. On the innovation side, we've seen it's mostly private companies in the US and around the world, 90% of compounds in development uh, come from the private sector. Uh, these have, uh, uh, they put everything in their library of, of potential therapies and, and vaccines into clinical trials uh, in, in collaboration with the CDC and the, and, and the FDA. Um, and so we've seen, uh, this is all coming together now with uh, eight months since the pandemic, uh, uh, dramatic improvements in the, in the innovation supply chain. We've, we're usually these take 10 to 15 years for a vaccine to be developed and approved to market. And now what we've seen is uh, uh, this has been shortened down to eight months and then it'll be nine months, probably next month when, when the first vaccines are approved. So we've gone from 10 to 15 years to nine months and 300 million doses. Uh, so this is a dramatic success for the U.S. and for the world and what's been uh, achieved. So I want to uh, review a little bit of some of the breakthroughs that are part of these vaccines. Not only are we having vaccines, but they've also furthered science. Uh, Moderna and uh, BioNTech, uh, which have the first vaccines that are on track to be approved uh, in December. Uh, these are mRNA vaccines. This is not something that's been uh, developed before. They're not in a medicine uh, before now, but their, their research and their company started two decades before. Um, these are the, vac the mRNA vaccines is a synthetic uh, message that's sent to the cells to tell them the exact antigen to make to inoculate the body against uh, COVID-19. Um, other uh, past vaccines use an uh, inactivated form of the virus to expose the body's immune system to make something, uh, to make what the body uh, decides is the best immunity. But this uh, mRNA vaccine is a synthetic message to tell it, make exactly this one. It's the most effective uh, response. Uh, and these were, uh, so this is a breakthrough in, in that science and a breakthrough in the delivery message. And then uh, in addition, once it seems once these processes are developed, uh, it's relatively quick to make the vaccine since Moderna and BioNTech received the, the DNA breakdown from Chinese authorities of the virus. They made this vaccine in only 25 days before submitting it to uh, the FDA to begin cl clinical trials. So the 280 days since then has been in a regulatory process. And uh, if this works, and it looks like it's more effective than anyone could have dreamed about, 90% 90, 90 plus, 95% plus effective. Uh, there's other vaccines in the pipeline to treat chikungunya, uh, can cancers, tumors, and uh, it's exciting to see how this goes forward. And then, uh, the next vaccines, vaccines that are due to be uh, approved are from AstraZeneca and Oxford and Johnson & Johnson. These are also uh, a different uh, technique that hasn't been uh, approved yet in a vaccine. They use adenovirus vectors. Uh, this is a small flu that is uh, very effective at spreading in the body and, and going into cells, but they, it's, uh, it's been its its severity has been reduced, so it's harmless. And they use the adenovirus vectors to uh, send uh, the the protein of the COVID uh, 
uh, hook. So the, the body can to begin developing an immune response to, uh, to the proteins in COVID-19. Um, so these are, uh, this, this uh, technique has been developed over 30 years using adenovirus vectors. And, and the mRNA research has been developed over two decades. But both uh, uh, Moderna and BioNTech have not have uh, had an approved medicine with this technology yet. So it's only through licensing agreements, uh, patents that help uh, secure this property uh, to attract investments to create uh, these breakthrough technologies. And it's only and it's uh, the same way with other uh, biotech startups is that this technology is developed slowly over time, and uh, but it's only through property rights to secure this intangible property that they can remain viable businesses and uh, and are ready for when something like this uh, happens to receive capital and accelerate investment to, to further their innovation. I want to say a little bit about state-backed vaccines. Sorry. There are four vaccines um, that are in later stage trials from China and one from Russia. Uh, in China, there are two from a state-owned enterprise, one from an enterprise that's in cooperation with the Chinese military, and uh, one from a private company. And then Russia has uh, one vaccine they've developed through their National Research Institute called the Sputnik uh, 5 vaccine. Um, these have skipped all the, a lot of the regulatory processes uh, the other vaccines have gone through. Uh, so it's hard to verify their safety and efficacy. It's hard to verify their uh, effectiveness, uh, but that hasn't stopped uh, these countries from, from using it and from exporting it to other countries. Uh, China has, uh, one of their vaccines has gone, has, uh, they've used it to inoculate almost 500,000 people outside of clinical trials. So uh, we have to be concerned about uh, not only how effective it is in these countries to stopping the spread of the disease, but uh, what are the national security other uh, ramifications when these are traded to other countries uh, with agreements that aren't uh, public. Uh, next, I want so we review, you use the uh, property rights index, the scores for the intellectual property component, and took a look at where are these uh, compounds being made uh, to, to fight COVID-19 and uh, what are the IP scores in those countries. So overall, there's 773 unique compounds in clinical trials. Uh, created to address COVID-19. 194 are vaccines and uh, are compounds in vaccine, vaccines. 213 are antivirals. 366 are compounds and treatments. Um, we know it takes typically 12 years to go from discovery to market approval. And that costs about on average 2.8 billion and only less than 10% uh, make it through uh, clinical trials to approval. So we know that IP rights are integral to uh, securing that property so that long-term investments can be made uh, to see that happen. Uh, anecdotally, we've seen how companies that have developed these leading vaccine candidates come from largely the private market and largely in the United States. Uh, and we also know that in a, the International Property Rights Index has an almost perfect 0.92 uh, correlation with the Global Biotechnology Index. So we know that property rights are really important to have facilitating this innovation. Uh, for this, so when we look at where, where are these uh, companies located, universities, even state-owned enterprises that are developing these compounds, we find that the strongest 20% uh, of scores from the property rights index are home to companies responsible for 73% of therapies in development to fight COVID-19. But when we look just at the IP component, uh, the top 15 countries with the highest IP scores uh, from the score 8 to 9.0, uh, 
they are home to companies developing 85% of the compounds in development to fight COVID-19. And the outlier there is actually the United States. Uh, of those top 15 countries, the average number of compounds in development from companies in, in, uh, in those countries is about 42. But the United States is home, is responsible for, uh, companies in the United States are responsible for 402 compounds in development to fight COVID-19. So over half of the compounds in development come from the United States and 90% uh, of those from the private market. Uh, and then I wanna address, uh, there's a lot of concern over access to vaccines and medicines. And, and this is how I'll finish up. Uh, what we know now uh, going forward, because we see the vaccines uh, beginning to meet final approvals and we see that the supplies are, are generated uh, almost enough doses for half of America, 300 million doses. Um, the next, the, the main barrier to access that we see going forward is going to be in regulatory approvals uh, because we see the doses being made and uh, the COVAX facility uh, through CEPI and Gavi, which purchases, making the same type of advanced market commitments as uh, BARDA. Uh, they're on track to have a billion doses in the next year, uh, but these have to be distributed around the world. Uh, but it's not automatic once a vaccine is approved by the FDA or a vaccine is approved by European authorities. It's not automatically there for Indonesia, uh, for Thailand, uh, for other countries, because we don't all have share uh, regulatory cooperation agreements. Uh, different authorities, regulatory authorities will demand additional data uh, to be delivered to their laboratories to test it. They often demand uh, documentation review periods, and they may demand uh, specific types of clinical trials in their countries. But we know if uh, that the standards in the United States and uh, many other countries, including Europe, are very high to reach approval. And uh, it's going to be a delay to have these other barriers in the way before these vaccines uh, can be distributed into the market and to the rest of the population. So thank you so much, Lorenzo and, uh, and Sari and Hernando. Uh, I'll be ready for questions later. Thank you, uh, Philip, for your presentation, for your case study. I think it's very permanent. Uh, what's going on now in the in the world? So I think it will be very useful for everyone to read your case study and, and see how uh, important are intellectual property rights. Now we are moving uh, with uh, Martin Vanstead is the last speakers. Uh, we apologize, we are abusing the time. We are running over time, but uh, I think the conversation was very very interesting. So Martin Vanstead is a, a director of a legal research for the Free Market Foundation in South Africa, and he wrote a case study on undoing 26 years of progress, property rights in South Africa. Martins, I know you have a problem with the video, but uh, you are joining us. I oh, know you are here. Okay, wonderful. And uh, please, the floor is yours. You need to mute yourself. Great. Thank you, Lorenzo, and to the Property Rights Alliance for the opportunity to present to you today. I hope my connection is now uh, better and that everyone can hear me clearly. Um, but without further ado, uh, so South Africa dominated the international uh, scene on occasion during the previous century because of its brutal policy of apartheid, which uh, many people would still remember from those Cold War days. Uh, so according to apartheid, people who are not white were by and large excluded from the benefits of the market economy. And that specifically included safe and secure property rights, which the vast majority of South Africans could not access. The world recognized the injustice uh, of apartheid and put immense pressure on the South African political class to, re to reform. And that happened. Between 1990 and 1996, South Africa reformed and adopted a constitutional dispensation that recognized and protected private property rights of all South Africans without regard to, to their uh, race or skin color. Um, South Africa no longer occupies such a prominent uh, place in international discourse, but perhaps it should, because the gains that were won at the end of apartheid 
are now being undone by the apparently and perhaps ostensibly democratic government. The government has now proposed uh, to amend South Africa's post-apartheid constitution, particularly its property rights provision, Section 25, by removing the requirement that compensation be paid whenever government expropriates or seizes private property. The amendment does not explicitly remove the right to private property per se, but if government may decide for itself whether or not to pay compensation when it engages in expropriation, effectively no security of tenure remains, meaning that the right to property is essentially dead letter law. So expropriation without compensation, or EWC as it is known locally, was adopted as a policy plank of the African National Congress, or ANC, South Africa's ruling party, at its December 9, uh, 2017 leadership uh, conference. Two months thereafter, in February 2018, uh, Parliament, where the uh, ANC control is an absolute majority, adopted a resolution in support of EWC and directed Parliament's Constitutional Review Committee to investigate and make recommendations surrounding a potential amendment to the Constitution to make EWC a reality. After the 2019 election, the ANC and its allies, uh, which is a Marxist-Leninist party known, uh, known very much incorrectly as the Economic Freedom Fighters, uh, together have sufficient parliamentary votes to adopt the constitutional amendment. So they control more than two thirds of the National Assembly of Parliament and thus can uh, on their own amend the constitution. According to government, sections 25.2 and 25.3 of the constitution, which provide that government must provide just and equitable compensation to owners when it expropriates their property is problematic. Uh, it is said that the requirement to pay compensation has hindered the government from implementing a substantive land reform program and righting the, the wrongs of apartheid. And hence, the requirement to pay compensation should be abolished or otherwise modified. The draft Constitution 18th Amendment Bill was published in uh, late 2019 and significantly changes the constitutional compensation regime. So part of South Africa's post-apartheid order is the notion of restitution. In light of South Africa's history of property dispossession along racial lines, those who have been deprived of their property or their descendants are entitled to have their property restituted or to comparable redress, like the payment of an amount of money that is comparable to the value of their property if they do not wish to move. So restitution obviously lies at the very heart of the theory of private property because it's a matter of justice. If your property was taken from you or from your ancestors, then naturally you have a right to claim that property back. Since 1994, the Land Claims Court has resolved over 95% of restitution claims, meaning that over 1.8 million South Africans have either received back their property uh, or they have opted to take money instead. But more can obviously be done to capacitate this process. For instance, uh, we need more judges in the land claims court. That's just one example. Unfortunately, however, the post-apartheid government has not concerned itself exclusively with the justice of restitution as it should have. Instead, the government has engaged in depriving true owners of their property as part of its land reform program for various constitutionally unjust justifiable reasons. Hence, in the discourse, one hears of redistribution and even nationalization of property. Both redistribution and nationalization are ahistorical, uh, very much unlike restitution, as they do not require into the history of the acquisition of the property. Instead, the property is uh, identified on the basis of arbitrary factors, such as whether it is owned by a foreigner, something which, is, which the government wants to ban, which is foreign uh, property ownership, or whether the owner has too much uh, private property, uh, and thus some of that needs to be redistributed. Um, and on that basis, the government expropriates the property. That property is then given to other people who have no objective link to the property. It wasn't once theirs or that of their ancestors. They're just random people 
who have now received the property, but more often than not, these people are politically connected, friends of the government or friends of politicians who receive once productive private property because it was expropriated, uh, or the state simply keeps the property for itself in its own name and leases it out. Now, the government has adopted a false narrative to sell EWC to South Africans and to foreign leaders and businesses. The president, Sir Ramaphosa, and his ministers have gone around South Africa and the world saying, and often implying, in essence, that EWC will only apply to agricultural land, only apply to land owned by white South Africans, and that it will not harm the economy, it will not harm food security, and it won't harm South Africa's prospects for attracting investment. Now, these assurances have on the whole been believed uh, quite worryingly. Um, for instance, uh, President Ramaphosa seemed to succeed in wooing the previous Prime Ministers of the United Kingdom, David Cameron and Theresa May, who uh, expressed concerns about EWC. But after speaking to the President and hearing his assurances, they said that they are quite satisfied that the South African government is acting appropriately, which is extremely worrying. So the reality of EWC is very different from these assurances. Government's proposed amendment to the Constitution, uh, the 18th Amendment Bill, uh, was published in December 2019 and provides that a court may find that zero compensation should be, pay should be paid for land or improvements on land. Important, it includes improvements on land uh, when it is expropriated. So a court gets this uh, uh, final say according to the bill as it currently is. But more important than that, Parliament is empowered to determine an ordinary legislation adopted with a simple majority, not a constitutional majority, under which circumstances a court may make this determination. So the bill introduces a parliamentary discretion to determine in which cases land and uh, improvements on land may be expropriated without compensation. But even today, the ANC is suggesting that the court's power to determine when expropriation may take place at no compensation must be replaced with an executive authority, meaning that someone in government will make that, that final decision, when the courts will only retain the power of judicial review. That is also worrying. We want the courts to make the decision, not to simply review the decision. What is clear then is that the government is simply giving itself the power to determine quite easily with a parliamentary majority when it wants to take property without paying for it. The amendment bill does not contain any proviso that only white land may be targeted or that expropriation may only take place if the economy will go unharmed. While the current draft amendment speaks only of land and improvements, it no doubt set it, that sets a precedent that could be expanded to all manner of other property, including uh, intellectual property. One should also bear in mind that the ANC government has become increasingly interested in using private pensions and saving, savings accounts to bail out its failing state enterprises. So one must uh, bear that context in mind to see the intention that government has. Any property will be liable for taking eventually, and it will have terrible economic consequences. And of course, expropriation without compensation will also not simply apply to the shrinking white minority in South Africa. This is a myth that the international media has unfortunately spread, and in so doing has uh, done a lot of harm to the cause of non-racial property rights in South Africa. It is in the government's interest to make the discourse around property ownership a black versus white issue, so as to divert attention away from the fact that the government's biggest constituency, black South Africans, are in just as much trouble, if not more, uh, as anyone else's. The South African economy started to contract significantly before the amendment to the constitution has even been made. And certainly now in light of the COVID-19 lockdown, we are already in dire straits. In August 2018, it was reported that the affordable home market has been hit hard by the prospect of EWC, with the demand for affordable housing declining by 40%. This is due to the fact that those poor and middle class people who would usually be purchasing property in this market believe that they will be given property for free in the future by the government after the government has seized it from others. Furthermore, in November 2018, it was shown that most commercial farmers have scaled back on expansion projects because of the uncertainty surrounding EWC. 
Among other things, farmers have stopped purchasing new equipment or investing in their property simply because they now foresee the property being taken from them sometime in the future. So to say that EWC won't harm the economy when it is enacted, when it is already harming the economy before it has been enacted, is a fantasy. This is not even to mention the economic devastation that has been inflicted in Zimbabwe and Venezuela in large part due to government seizing property arbitrarily. Expropriation without compensation as a constitutional device will apply to all property, all, all people, and all the time if it is enacted. The government has expertly crafted a misleading and deceitful narrative around the policy that most people seem to accept, and this acceptance will haunt South Africa for many years to come. The eternal vigilance that is said to be the price for freedom is not being paid. South Africa has a long and tumultuous history of violent dispossession of property rights. The, the democratic transition of the 1990s was meant to represent a break from this shameful past. But the South African government has seen fit, not three decades later, to start reversing the gains uh, made during the transition is very unfortunate, and this trend ought to be stopped. Only with a healthy respect for property rights can South Africa escape the economic malaise caused, caused not only by the recent COVID-19 lockdown, but by decades of, of authoritarian economic policy. I thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Martin, for uh, your great work on uh, defending property rights. Uh, actually, a few years ago uh, with Sari, we were in South Africa presenting the index uh, and I know the situation is not easy at all. Uh, expropriation without compensation is something very dangerous and uh, will affect the, the, the fundamental of the economy. Uh, we saw what happened in Zaire uh, in the 90s, and uh, this same type of policy destroyed completely the uh, agriculture in that country. So we really hope to look forward to work with you guys, uh, Free Market Foundation, and back soon in South Africa and uh, try to convince uh, everyone that the property rights are the most important guarantee for freedom of everyone. So um, I don't think we have a, a question. And um, in the same time, I really <laughs> want to apologize for we are abusing uh, most of our time. We are completely around of time. But uh, I think that the, I found the presentation and uh, very exciting and very useful and uh, really I want to take opportunity to thank you again, everyone, for your time and participation for this uh, 2020 uh, global launch. We are very grateful to our, all our partners for uh, helping promoting defending property rights all over the world. The, Dr. Nando de Soto remind us property rights guarantee freedom and provide incentive allowing people to live and work for a purpose and not be locked out of the formal economy. Without an integrated formal property system, a modern market economy is inconceivable. So let me conclude that because of this pandemic time, now more than ever, it is evident how innovation and intellectual property rights are playing an important role in finding solution to COVID-19. And uh, I'm really grateful to Philip Thompson for the case study on these uh, issues, very important uh, and very to keep us fighting for the innovation in intellectual property rights. Property rights are not only uh, one of the most important pillars of any free society, but also are human rights as stated in Article 17 of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Sari, Hernando, John Sandage, um, everyone that uh, uh, make this global launch uh, happen and I really appreciate the work we have been doing. Uh, and we look forward to work with you all in the 2021 edition. And hopefully next time we will be able to present the index, the index with the traditional conference. Uh, every year we change location. Last year we did in Southeast Asia, especially the global launch was in the Philippines. So this year was uh, everything is online. So I know that people also are completely overwhelmed with uh, a lot of webinar. <laughs> it's more than one year, almost one year that we have been uh, uh, using the online system webinar for uh, to communicate our message and our um, battle. So, but there again, I really appreciate the work we are doing. Uh, it was great to have Hernando de Soto with us. Uh, and uh, again, thank you so much uh, for all the work you are doing. Please follow us in Twitter and uh, check out the um, website of the International Property Right Index. And again, we are happy to share for free the data there behind 
Market Index. And uh, let me know uh, if you want to be in touch with the, uh, our economy, Cesare Levi Cassin, that he's been doing great work all these years. And uh, again, looking forward to work with all of you again. And stay safe. And uh, thank you so much. So please allow me to thank you uh, for having me in this lunch. And of course, to thank PR and all the organization, all the all the panelists. And as Lorenzo said, we are happy to share everything, all the results with you. Please follow us in the media and of course, check the webpage. And thank you, Lorenzo, for this opportunity that we're having year after year sharing our thoughts and our reports. Thank you, Sari. Thank you, everyone.